Praise the Lord. Are you still there? You've gone somewhere. I said, Praise the Lord. Let's close our eyes for prayer. Father, we thank you for this time. We bless your name because we know you are a good God. You are fashioning us and remolding us and remaking us. And you are doing something wonderful and good in our lives. And Lord, we are praying what you have begun to do, you will continue to you finish in Jesus' name. Perfect your will in every life. And make of us giants and champions of faith and leaders that will stand true to your word in Jesus' name. That Lord, in everything we do, in our various locations in our ministries, your name will be glorified in our lives and ministries. Thank you, Lord, because we know you have answered. In Jesus' name we pray. A better amen. God bless you. I'm looking at an important subject at this time. In fact, whatever you know and whatever you have and whatever you plan to do, if there is no single-mindedness that makes you to have a focus in life, makes you to determine the direction you ought to go, and you stick to that direction until you reach your destination, you will not be able to amount to much in life. What makes a man, what makes a woman to succeed in the chosen trade, chosen profession, chosen ministry, where the Lord has appointed him, is this one single quality of single-mindedness. That's why we come to the subject, the consecration and the commitment of a single-minded leader. And there is one example in the Bible, there are many examples, but there is one example in the Bible that stands out very clear. And that's the example of Nehemiah. Nehemiah had the consecration and the commitment of a single-minded leader. He labored in the midst of vicious opposition. His enemies were relentless. And he tried every conceivable tactic to impede his work and his ministry and yet he faithfully kept at it until his task of building the wall was complete by the way we're talking about building the wall what, what was the significance of the wall to the people of israel to the people of god at that time not even to the people of israel only to the people in the world at the time that the Himal lived number one it was for protection number two it revealed their power number three it gave them preservation number four it was a mark of possession where possessed the land we fence it around. We build a wall around it. It is ours. Number five, it was for prestige. The prestige of the city that had strong walls, thick walls all around it. And it was a comparison between this walled, faced city and this other city. That is just struggling without any wall. And so you will find that as you look at the Bible, you look at the word of God. And then you see that these uh, people, uh, they were so serious about building a wall. Because they knew for them the significance of that wall. In Jeremiah chapter 15. Jeremiah chapter 15 verses 20 and 21. In Jeremiah 15, 20 and 21, here it says, I will make thee unto this people a first brazen wall. That is, there's protection. That means then, as you look at the wall, number one, it gives you a sense and understanding of protection. Isaiah chapter 25. In Isaiah chapter 25, I'm reading to you from verse 3 and from verse 4. 
Therefore shall the strong people glorify thee. The city of the terrible nations shall fear thee. Why? For thou hast been a strength to the poor. A strength to the needy in his distress. A refuge from the storm. A shadow from the heat. When the blast of the terrible wars is as a storm against the wall. The wall, number one, is for protection. Number two, it is for power. Number three now, it is for preservation. If you look at 1 Samuel chapter 25. 1 Samuel chapter 25, I'm reading from verse 15. It says in 1 Samuel 25 verse 15, But the men were very good unto us, and we were not hurt. Neither missed we any sin as long as we were conversant with them. When we were in the fields, and then in verse 16 it says, They were a wall unto us, both by night and day. All the while we were with them keeping the sheep. That means we were preserved. Because the men of David, they surrounded us and we were preserved. Preservation was for possession in Ezra chapter 9. Ezra chapter 9, I'm reading to you from verse 9. In Ezra chapter 9, here in verse 9, hear what we're told about the wall. For we were born men, yet our God has not forsaken us in our bondage, but has extended mercy unto us in the sight of the kings of Persia. To give us a reviving. To set up the house of our God. And to repair the desolations thereof. And to give us a wall in Judah and Jerusalem. To give us our possession. Number five is for prestige. For prestige. If you look at Revelation chapter 21. Revelation chapter 21. We're looking at verses 14. 18 and the first part of verse 19. Revelation 21 verse 14. And the wall of the city had 12 foundations. And in them the names of the 12 apostles of the Lamb. 18. And the building of the wall of it was of jasper. And the city was pure gold like unto clear crystal. And the foundations of the wall of the city were garnished and beautified with all manner of precious stones. It was for prestige. Therefore then you understand as Nehemiah was far away in a foreign land. And he learned that the walls were broken down. And the whole city was all in rubble. It was like everything was broken down. He knew the protection of the people of God was gone. And the power of the people of God had been totally smashed and destroyed and crushed. And the preservation of the people of God was in doubt. It means that the possession of the people of God had been taken away from them. And the people of Israel that ought to be heard, having the power and the prestige, and having the privilege of being the head and not the tail, that privilege had been taken away from them. And because of that, he had something in his mind. I will restore the walls around the city of Jerusalem. I will bring back again the protection and the power and the preservation and the possession and the prestige of the people of God. And there was a desperate need for someone at that time to step forward with vision. And singleness of heart. And singleness of purpose to lead God's people in rebuilding the walls that have crumbled. The walls that so urgently need to be rebuilt today. Are the walls of righteousness. And the walls of holiness. What gives us power? Protection. Prestige. And possession of what the Lord has promised us. 
what gives the church preservation in the corrupt world in which we live more than the walls of righteousness and the walls of holiness that are broken down the protective walls that are essential to the survival of the church and that's why as we come to nehemiah we're looking at this single minded leader and we're saying if the lord could do it through him the lord will do it through you i say the lord will do it through you but look at his consecration look at his commitment nehemiah chapter 6 nehemiah chapter 6 looking at verse 3 and i sent messengers unto them saying i am doing a great work would you know that the lord has called you to a great thing a great work and will you commit yourself to that great work or will you refuse any distraction from that great work and will you understand the value the walls that the lord the price the lord has placed upon you that you are doing a great work nehemiah sent messengers with detractors he said i am doing a great work so i cannot come down why should the work cease while i leave it and come down to you that's a single mindedness of this great leader in the bible in nehemiah chapter 4 nehemiah chapter 4 i'm reading from verse 17 they which builded on the wall and they that bear the burdens were those that laid it every one with one of his sons wrought in the work and the other hand held a weapon for the builders every one had a sword guarded by his side and so builded and he that sounded the trumpet was by me verse 23 so neither i nor my brethren nor my servants nor the men of the guard which followed me none of us put off our clothes saving except that everyone put them off for washing you see they were so single-minded in the work they were doing for the lord that when the enemy will assail when the enemy will come against them nehemiah counseled the people instructed the people with one hand you will hold the instrument to build with the other hand you'll hold the weapon you'll be at a lurch so that at any time you hear the trumpet sound and somebody is trying to bring down the walls we are building you'll get at them and attack them send them out of the way and continue the work of the lord that is a single mindedness of a leader that knows i'm called to do a great thing and nothing from hell and nothing on earth and nothing from shambalat and nothing from tobiah will stop the work the lord has called committed into my hand and that's the attitude you are going to have and that's the victory you are going to have you are going to stand and you are going to remain and you are going to do that work nobody turning you around and nobody being able to put your back to the wall and nobody able being able to stop you from the work the lord has committed into your hand in chapter 6 verses 15 and 16 so the wall was finished in the 20th day of the month elul in 52 days and it came to pass that when all our enemies heard thereof that and all the heathen that were about us saw these things they were much cast down in their own eyes for they perceived that this work was wrought of our god eventually the enemies gave in they said you cannot stop nehemiah he has finished building that wall and we perceive it is the god of heaven that has helped him that same god of heaven will help you as he succeeded you are going to succeed with single-mindedness with consecration with commitment the work will be done i divide the message to three parts very simple number one the conviction number two the courage and then number three we're talking about 
will be the consecration and the cleansing. Look at this, number one. The conviction of a single-minded leader. The conviction of a single-minded leader. Number two, the courage of a single-minded leader. The courage of a single-minded leader. Number three, the consecration and cleansing through a single-minded leader. Consecration and cleansing through a single-minded leader. Come to number one. The conviction of a single-minded leader. Single-mindedness produces conviction. See a man that will not be about many things, will not be combat about many things. A man that has just one thing to think about, one thing to get involved in, one thing to concentrate on. One thing to spend his life and his time on. One thing is meditating about. One thing is putting all his energy, all his resources, everything that he has. One thing is putting everything to. One thing is dreaming about. One thing is pursuing after. And there is just this one goal. There is just this one assignment that he concentrates upon. That man will have conviction. Single-mindedness produces conviction. And then next to that, conviction drives us to action. When you have conviction, that conviction drives you to action. A single-minded leader like Nehemiah refuses to compromise moral integrity. And he refuses to compromise his conviction no matter the cost to him personally. Nehemiah's conviction shines forth in his character. In his integrity, in his faithfulness, in his commitment, and in his refusal to compromise. The challenge of the time, of that time, called for a man who would not easily sell out. And Nehemiah was such a man. Look at him. In Nehemiah chapter 2. Nehemiah chapter 2, I'm reading from verse 11. As you read through this, and the heartbeat of the man, you, you can feel it. The vision of the man, you can see it. And the passion in his soul, you can see it. As you look at Nehemiah chapter 2, and I'm reading from verse 11, and so I came. He's talking, he's writing the history here in a personal way. So I came to Jerusalem, and was there three days. And I arose in the night. I and some few men with me, neither told I any man what my God has put in my heart to do at Jerusalem. It wasn't the talking type. It wasn't a talkative. It wasn't sharing with this and sharing with that. And it wasn't leaning on the people. I need your help. I need your help. Without you, I cannot do it. I am going to be a failure except you rise up and help me. And I want you to support me. I want you to smile at me. If you are not happy with me, I will not be able to move on. No, sir. He was a man of conviction. He said, neither did I even tell any man what my God put in my heart to do at Jerusalem. Neither was there any beast with me, save the beast that I wrote upon. And I went out by night, by the gate of the valley. He was going to look at everything. He was going to see everything first hand. Even before the dragon well to the dunk port and view the walls of Jerusalem, which were broken down. He saw everything. They were broken down. And the gates thereof that were consumed with fire. Then I went on to the gate of the fountain and to the king's pool. But there was no place for the beast that was under me to pass. The situation was so very bad. And then he said in verse 15, Then went I up in the night by the brook. 
and viewed the wall and turned back and entered by the gate of the valley and so returned and the rulers knew not whither I went or what I did neither had I as yet told it to the Jews not to the priests not to the nobles not to the rulers not to the rest that did the work and then he moves on to verse 17 he says then said I unto them you see the distress that we are in how Jerusalem lieth waste and the gates thereof are burnt with fire come and let us build up the wall of Jerusalem that we be no more a reproach after he had seen everything after he had viewed everything and he felt it to the very depth of his own heart the reproach that came upon the people of God it's like you collect all the reproach together in the hearts and the minds of all the people of Israel and you dump everything on Nehemiah alone he felt it to the very depth of his heart and then after he had felt it then he called upon the people he said can't you see what I see can't you feel what I feel? You see the distress that we're in. How Jerusalem lies waste, and the gates thereof are burnt with fire. Come, and let us build up the wall of Jerusalem, that we be no more. A reproach, then in verse 16, then I told them of the hand of my God, that which was good upon me. As also the king's words that he had spoken unto me. They said, they responded. It's easy to follow a single-minded man. It's very easy to follow after a man of conviction. And a man of one purpose. And a man of one plan. And a man of one desire. And a man of one single thing that their single life is supposed to achieve. And nobody wants to follow a man whose life is scattered here and there. If you start any project with him, you are not sure he's going to continue the project. And if you start anything with him, you are not sure it's going to follow through until the very end. Nobody wants to follow a man like that. But show me a single-minded man. And show me a man of one task, a man of one purpose, a man of one assignment, a man of one desire. And he wants to put everything he has into that one single, central, essential, important, indispensable thing. People want to follow him. And so, when Nehemiah spoke to the people, they were ready. When he said, then I told them that this is not something human. And this is not something personal. This is not just because of my idiosyncrasies or the peculiarities of my nature and constitution. I show them the hand of the Lord my God, which was good upon me. Not only that, also the king's words that he had spoken unto me. And they said, and they said, let us rise up and build. So they strengthen their hands for this good work. They strengthen their hands. I've seen in my hands already. I've been thinking about it for months and for weeks. And I've been putting everything upon the altar. And I've gone through myself. I have investigated and I've seen everything. And because I have strengthened myself and I'm rising up to the occasion, the people I called to come around me, they too, they were ready. He himself was a man of conviction and then he brought about conviction, conviction in the hearts of the people. I want to ask you a question. What produces, what generates conviction in a leader? You are a leader. And then you are wondering, I wish I had conviction. I wish I had this impetus within. Something that stands up within me. That I just know this is a single solitary thing to live for in my life. What generates and produces conviction in a leader? Let me show you from the lifestyle, from the ministry of Nehemiah. Number one, interest. Number two, investigation or interrogation. 
Number three, intercession. Number four, identification. Number five, insight or illumination. Number six, internalization. Internal. You internalize it. Internalization. Number seven, involvement. As you look at Nehemiah, and you follow him through from the very beginning of the record in Nehemiah, and you follow through, and you follow through, and you follow through, until you find him standing up and showing the very demonstration of conviction of a single-minded leader. You're going to find all these things. Go with me to Nehemiah chapter 1. Nehemiah chapter 1, you will see interest, interest. In Nehemiah chapter 1, I'm looking at verse 1. The words of Nehemiah, the son of Achaliah. And it came to pass in the month of Chislew, in the 20th year, as I was in Shushan, the palace. He was in the palace. But he had interest in the things concerning the poor people, and the oppressed people, and the unfortunate people, and the downtrodden people. But way far in Jerusalem. He did not say, well, I'm taken care of. I'm rich. I'm privileged. I'm serving the king of Persia. And what else am I looking for? He had interest. When you begin to pick interest, interest in children, interest in the youth, and interest in the university students or college students, you begin to pick interest in the affairs of the women, and you begin to pick up interest in the lifestyle and the difficulties and the problems and the pressures in a society. Interest is the number one thing, is the first thing that will come in your heart, and then eventually conviction will build up in verse 2. And Ananiah, one of my brethren, came, and he and certain men of Judah and I ask them, I ask them I'm interested, I'm concerned, I want to know what's happening to our people what's the condition of our people I ask them concerning the Jews that had escaped which were led of the captivity and concerning Jerusalem and they said unto me the remnant that are led of the captivity there in the province are in great affliction and reproach and the wall of Jerusalem also is broken down and the gates thereof are born to a fire and it came to pass when I heard these words that I sat down and I wept and mourned certain days and fasted and prayed before the God of heaven. Number one, interest. How much interest do you have? In the nations in Africa and beyond Africa. In the eternal destiny of the people around you. And as you see people going up and down, and you see them, they don't have Christ. They don't have eternal life. And many are dying every day. They are dying of various, various things. What interest do you have when you pick up the newspapers and you hear that earthquake happened? That this earthquake claimed tens of thousands of lives of people. And that many, many people just died and they went to a lost eternity. How do you think about that? What interest do you have? What concern do you have? As you hear, you read in the newspapers about the crime and about how people are living their lives and about how families are getting disintegrated. What interest do you have? If you're going to be single-minded, if you're going to have conviction, it starts with number one. What's that number one? Interest. Number two, investigation or interrogation. Investigation. You are probing in. You are asking questions. You are trying to find out. You are searching. You want to know what is the condition of the people. Investigation, chapter 1, verse 2. And that Ananiah, one of the brethren, came and he and certain men of Judah. And I asked them, I asked them, I asked them concerning the Jews that had escaped, which were led of the captivity and concerning Jerusalem. Do you ever ask any question? Do you ever investigate anything? 
Does it concern you? What's happening to people? Do you even have interaction with members of the church and with the invitees that are brought to the church? Do you know what they are going through? Do you know the problems and the heartaches that they bear? Or do you just prepare your messages in isolation, theoretically? You don't care what's happening to them. You don't know what's happening to them. You don't even... During the retreat, if people are asking questions, you are not there. You are, you are somewhere else because they, they are, their questions and, and their problems and the things that bother them, they don't concern you. If you are going to develop conviction and if you are going to be a single-minded leader, number one, interest. Number two, investigation. Number three, it is intercession in verse four. And it came to pass when I heard these words that I sat down. And I wept, and I mourned certain days, and fasted, and prayed before the God of heaven. And then in verse 5, and I said, I beseech thee, I'm asking, I'm pleading, O Lord God of heaven, the great and terrible God that keepeth covenant and mercy for them that love him and observe his commandments. Let thine ear now be attentive and thine eyes open that thou mayest hear the prayer of thy servants which I pray before thee now day and night for the children of Israel thy servants and confess the sins of the children of Israel which we have sinned against thee both I and my father's house have seen. Do you see? Intercession. If you are going to actually have conviction over a group of people, and you are going to be a single-minded leader, and the need of the people will be so much registered on your mind, and registered on your heart, that you will know, there is no other thing for me to do at this time. I abandon every other thing. I'm going to be single-mindedly committed unto this thing here. You are going to pray about it. Already, you are interested. Already, you are investigating. Already, you are praying on all the facts and the things that you have got already. Number four, identification. You identify with the people. I am where they are. They are where I am. And the problem is not just their problem. And the difficulty is not just their difficulty. I'm part of this. I'm one of the causes of this sin. Look at it in verse 6. Let thine ear now be attentive and thine eyes open that thou mayest hear the prayer of thy servant, which I pray before thee now, day and night, for the children of Israel. And then he says, thy servants, and confess the sins of the children of Israel, because which we have sinned against thee. We, identification, I'm identifying with them. And you know, whenever we consider the plight of people, whenever we consider, uh, we hear that HIV AIDS is uh, destroying people, it's their problem. They will not listen. They're living immoral lives. That, that's why. How did they come to live immoral lives? If you got to them preaching the gospel, if you got to them telling them about Christ, if you got to them and you spoke about the Redeemer before they got to that situation, see, a lot of the people having the HIV AIDS now, what age bracket do they have? Maybe uh, the majority might be between the age of, in our own country here, and in many parts of Africa, between 13, 14, and maybe 30. You have AIDS, HIV, outside that bracket, but the majority, think about it. And if we had been interested in all those young people, and we reach out to the children, and we reach out to the youth 30 years ago, 25 years ago, and 20 years ago, the majority of the people having HIV in your station now, where you are now, will they be having it? It's part of the problem. It's part of our negligence. It's not just their problem. It is our problem. Identification. You share part of the blame. 
You share part of the reproach. And you share part of the guilt. It is when that identification is there, you want to get something done. I'm talking about number five, insight or illumination. In chapter one, I'm reading verses eight and nine. Chapter one, verse eight. Remember, I beseech thee, the word which thou commandest thy servant Moses, saying, If ye transgress, I will scatter you abroad among the nations. But if ye turn unto me and keep my commandments and do them, though there were of you cast out unto the uttermost part of heaven, yet I will gather them from theirs and will bring them unto the place that I have chosen to search my name there. This man had insight into the covenant of God, insight into the promise of God. His mind was Having illumination, the light of the word, thy word is a lamp unto my feet. And he was well informed, well instructed in the word of God. And because of that insight, and because of that illumination of his mind, in things concerning the covenant of God and the promise of God, this man, the Lord was preparing him as he went from interest to investigation to intercession to identification and to insight. And now he made it personal. Internalization. Chapter 2, I'm reading from verse 1. And it came to pass, in the months of Nisan, in the twentieth year of Artaxerxes the king, that wine was before him, I took up the wine, and I gave it to the king. Now I had not been before such in his presence. Wherefore the king said unto me, Why is thy countenance sad, seeing thou art not sick? This is nothing else but sorrow of heart. There, there is something internal. There is something personal. There is something that is eating you up on the inside. There is something that is taking your normal joy and your normal cheerfulness away from you. And there is an internal thought, an internal preoccupation that is coming upon you. And I can see it upon your face. Then was I so afraid, and I said unto the king, Let the king live forever. Why should not my countenance be sad? When the city, the place of my father's sepulchres, lies waste, and the gates thereof are consumed with fire. You see that? Internalization. When you, the problem, you take the problem away from the newspaper, you internalize it. Look at these children that are just dying like that. Those could have been any of my children too. Were it not for the light of the gospel that came to them? Look at these old aged people that are just wasting away and there's nobody to take care of them. That could have happened to my aged parents too. Were it not for that the gospel came to our family? And look at these men that are breaking up in their families and their problems, you know, is every, every family is scattering. That could have happened to my family too. Were it not for the gospel that came to me you internalize it and when you make it personal and internal and you know this could have happened to me as well then it becomes a problem that you are thinking about that drives you to action with conviction and then involvement comes in in nehemiah chapter 2 nehemiah chapter 2 i'm reading from verse 4 then the king said unto me for what dost thou make request? So I prayed to the God of heaven. And I said to the king, If it please the king, And if thy servant have found favor in thy sight, That thou wouldest send me unto Judah. I want to get involved. I don't just want to send a letter of encouragement to the people. They are saying, try and build up the walls. I am going to get involved myself. You help me, and, I, and you sent me unto Judah, unto the city of my father's sepulchers, that I may build it. And that those are the things that led this man to real conviction. The conviction of a single-minded leader. And you see this man, Nehemiah, as he listened to the sorrows and the needs of the great city 
and the people of God. The fire of conviction descended to stir his soul. He no longer desired the royal courts of Persia. You see, the great position that he had mattered not to him anymore. The need was so near. And the need was so heavy on his heart that the privilege he had in the court of Persia never amounted to anything anymore. Don't you understand that, that the Persian king, at his access, he will receive ambassadors, he will receive visitors from foreign countries because it was like emperor over an empire. And there were many countries and nations in that empire. And the ambassadors will always come. And then when the gifts were to be given to the king, he was the one that will take the gift from the ambassadors and then will give unto the king that privilege did not amount to anything for him anymore. He no longer valued the privilege of greeting those ambassadors and bringing their gifts unto the king. All that became nothing to him. When there is fire burning in your soul, and when there is conviction in your heart, when you see the needs of the people, and you want to be involved in bringing the gospel and the truth and the eternal verity that will save them away from the degradation of sin unto the bright side of the gospel and the grace of God, all the things of life will not matter to you anymore. They will become as nothing. For Nehemiah was ready to lay it all on the line to serve the Lord and to serve the people of God. Now let's go to point number two, the courage of a single-minded leader. And you look at this Nehemiah, as you read through and you look, you follow him. You follow him to the point is getting the leaders together. You follow him to the point is mobilizing the leaders. When you reach chapter 3, you'll see all the leaders immobilized because he got everybody involved, everybody around him to get the work done. And when you see his reaction and his response to the enemies that wanted to stop the progress of the work, and when you see the drive, and when you see the number of days it took them to finish building that wall, and uh, you see every step of the way, because the enemies were trailing him, and they used every gimmick and every tactic that they could find from their bag of deception, and from their plan of persecution, and yet this man will not be deterred, is single-minded leader that concentrated on the assignment of the day and the assignment of the time and until the work was finished nobody could hinder him you find courage there the courage of a single-minded leader and look at it now from chapter 2 in this in Nehemiah chapter 2 I'm reading from verse 9 then I came to the governors beyond the river and gave them the king's letters. Now the king had sent captains of the army and all men with me. Verse 10. When Shambalaj, the Horonite, and Tobiah, the servant, the Ammonite, heard of it, it grieved them exceedingly that there was come a man to seek the welfare of the children of Israel. Because they wanted those children of Israel permanently on the ground, permanently distressed, permanently under reproach. And when they found somebody that stood up to the task with single-mindedness, with conviction and courage, and said, this is a thing to do. And they found that the man had authority. Because he came with letters from the king. It grieved them. Look at verse 19. But when Shambalat the Horonite and Tobiah the Sabbath, the Ammonite, and Geshem, the Arabian, heard it, they laughed us to scorn. And they despised us. And they said, what is this sin that ye do? Will ye rebel against the king? They counted their courage, their conviction, their purpose, their plan, their desire to be used of God in restoring privilege, protection, preservation, and power 
unto the people of God in Jerusalem. They counted that as rebellion. Then answered I them, and said unto them, The God of heaven, he will prosper us. Nehemiah told them, I don't care how you feel. I don't care your interpretation, about your interpretation of my action, about your interpretation of my dedication, my devotion, and my commitment to the assignment before me. I don't care how you interpret it. Are you telling me that I'm rebelling against a king that gave me authority to come and build? I discussed with him. I took permission from him. I just did it as come from my work. And I took that letter. And I am come here to seek the welfare of the people of God. Are you calling that rebellion? You have right to your own opinion. Whatever you say, whatever you think, I'm telling you. The God of heaven, he will prosper us. Therefore, we, his servants, will arise and build. But ye have no portion, nor right, nor memorial in Israel. I pray God will give you that courage. That you'll be able to tell the people, here we are. And we've come to serve the Lord. And we will serve the Lord. I said we will serve the Lord. And we will tell all those Tobias and all those Shambhalas, we'll tell them, you have no portion, you have no right, you have no memorial in Jerusalem. Look at chapter 4. In chapter 4, I'm reading from verse 1. But it came to pass, that when Shambhalat heard that we built the wall, that he is, when they heard that they are ridicule, they are reproach, they are jesting, they are calling us names. Well, you cannot stop a man from doing what he ought to do, what he knows he ought to do. You begin to call him names. And you think that, well, if we are not killing him with the sword, let's discourage him and distress him with words. And we begin to kind of ridicule him. And we begin to reproach him. I begin to say he will hear this and he will not think about any other thing, but he will know that we count him as a nobody. We count him as a, as a non-entity. We count him as a fellow wasting his time. You fellow, you don't understand. You, you leave uh, the palace and you are coming here. You say you are building a wall. What are you thinking about? Are you rebelling against the king? By the way, the good job you had in that place, a great privilege, you left that thing and then you become so fanatical in religion. You say you are going to to build some walls in Jerusalem. What a non-entity, thoughtless fellow you are. I don't care the names you call me, but I want to tell you that I have an assignment. That's what Nehemiah was telling them. And that assignment will be carried out. I pray God will give you such a heart. You will have such a mind. And then you'll be able to serve the Lord without looking back in Nehemiah chapter 4 reading from verse 1. And it came to pass when Shambhalat heard that we built the walls, he was wroth. And he took great indignation and he mocked the Jews. And he spake before his brethren. And the army of Samaria, he even got an army involved now and said, what do these feeble Jews these powerless Jews, these impotent Jews, these Jews that don't have any kind of power, any kind of authority, what are they trying to do? Will they fortify themselves? Will they sacrifice? Will they make an end in a day? Will they revive the stones out of the heaps of the rubbish which are burnt? Now to buy the Ammonite was by him. And he said, even that which they build, if a fox go up, he shall even break down their stone walls. This Shambhala said, they are feeble. Are you saying they are feeble? Only even look at the walls they are building. If an ordinary fox will just climb over it, everything will crumble. What do they think they are trying to do? They belittle them. And they belittle their work. And they belittled their ability. And they belittled their intelligence. I'm telling you, they will call you names. They will reproach you. They will try to discourage you. They will try to distress you. But all those things will show of what material you are made. All those things, the reproach and the ridicule and the jesting and the calling of names, if you break down, 
because they make fun of you, because they jest about you. And if you give up the goal and you give up the assignment, it means originally you didn't really have a firm conviction to do what ought to be done. Even the walls they are trying to build, if a fox will go up, it will break everything down in a moment. And then he said in verse 4, Hear, O our God, for we are despised, and turn their reproach upon their own head, and give them for a prey. And then, in the land of captivity, and cover not their iniquity. Let not their sin be blotted out from before thee, for they have Provoke thee to anger before the builders. Look at verse 6. So built we the wall. In spite of their jesting, we kept on walking. In spite of their calling us names, we kept on walking. Ah, if they will not stop serving the devil, why should I stop serving God? If they will not stop serving the flesh, why should I stop serving the Lord? If they will not stop their negative assignment, why should I stop my positive assignment? If they are so serious and committed in the work of discouragement, why should I not pick up my courage and pick up everything I've got within me? If my enemies will not stop, why should I stop? If the followers of Satan will not stop, why should I stop? If the persecutors will not stop, why should I stop? The work must be done. And so Nehemiah said, in fact, the more they did what they did, the more I determined I would do what I have to do. So built we the wall, and all the wall was joined together unto the half thereof, for the people had a mind to work. Jump down to verse 10. And Judah said, the stress of the bearers of burdens is decayed. And there is much rubbish. So that we are not able to build the wall. And our adversary said, they shall not know. Neither see till we we'll come in the midst among them. And slay them. And cause the work to cease. The enemies were bragging. And then some of the elders in the land were saying, the strength of the bearers of the body is decaying. It looks like the assignment is so great, and the work is so heavy, and the people are getting tired. And then the enemies said, aha, aha. They themselves now they realize that they are getting weak. And Nehemiah the motivator. And Nehemiah the mobilizer. And Nehemiah the encourager. And Nehemiah the one, the, the driver, driving the people saying let us walk and let us build we're going to discourage him and then eventually the enemy said they shall not even know and they will not see they say they are constituted on their own until we come in the midst among them and will slay them will even kill them destroy them and cause the work to stop to cease and it came to pass when the jews which dwelt by them came they said unto us ten times Ten times, they will not give up. They wanted to stop them. They came the first time. They came the second time. Stop. Don't continue this work. What are you going to do? You cannot do this. Stop. And the third time they came, and the fourth time they came. And they kept on doing the work. And they came the fifth time. And the sixth time. And the seventh time. And the eighth time. And the ninth time. Ten times. What if the people come to you ten times? And they keep on coming. And they tell you, this kind of assignment and this kind of work, the salvation of people, and getting back, getting them back from the hands of the devil, and getting them back to the loving arms of the Savior, what do you think you're doing? And then they begin to tell you negatives, negatives, negatives about the consequence of the work you're doing. And it says, from all places when ye shall return unto us, we will be upon you. They were threatening them. And they did that over and over and over again. Look at verse 13. Therefore set I in the lower places behind the wall, and on the higher places I. Evil said the people after their families were their swords and their spears and their bows. And I looked and rose up and said unto the nobles and to the rulers and to the rest of the people, be not afraid of them. 
This man was a courageous man and his courage was contagious. He passed the courage around to them. He said, we are called, we are men of purpose. We are men of passion. And we are men for this period. If we don't do it, nobody else will do it. This is our calling. And Shambhalat, Tobiah, and the Jews are the people that join them to distract us and to destroy the world. They are no match to the power of God within us. We have a covenant keeping God on our side. Be not afraid of them. Remember the Lord, which is great and terrible. And fight for your brethren, your sons and your daughters and your wives and your houses. And it came to pass when our enemies heard that it was known unto us. And God had brought their counsel to naught that we returned all of us to the wall, every one unto his work. You see, that's a man, that's a leader that has conviction and that has courage. And that's what the Lord is calling you to. That whatever you hear, you will not be the man that goes to the pulpit and will say, well, we thank God we're saved. But you know, we have to be very, very careful because evangelism really makes, uh, you know, this community angry and unhappy with us. And I've been hearing some information. In fact, the traditional people and the occultic people and the, even the uh, intelligent uh, intellectuals around us here, uh, they, they are saying that, you know, our uh, kind of worship and noise is uh, disturbing them. And these peculiar doctrines we're holding on to one man, one wife, uh, is actually disturbing people. Now, church, I want to tell you, so that we, we, we don't... Don't uh, continue causing the anger and the wrath of the people around us. Can we just uh, pipe down a little bit and slow down a little bit? And uh, they, they say we are fanatical. They, they say that we carry this religion too much. Uh, and they say that we do not allow the sons of the land that should have been princes and chiefs and robbers and kings. We do not allow them to take their chieftaincy title. It's like we're against society. And because of that society is also against us uh, shall we do this thing with some intelligence and do this thing with a cool mind and then when you go if you talk to anybody you want to receive Jesus as your personal savior once he says no thank you don't bother me with us. I'm sorry I'm sorry I didn't know that you are not one of the elect please uh, go your way so uh, let us be very gentle Nehemiah says no are they aggressive we will be aggressive I said we will be aggressive. There is only one life to live and we are going to live it to the glory of God and we will preach the gospel. And you brothers and sisters in your location anywhere you are, nobody but nobody anywhere will stop your mouth and silence you in Jesus name. You go out not with fear. Not with timidity, not with shaking or trembling. You go out of this place with the courage of Nehemiah and the God of Nehemiah and the God of heaven will be with you. And the people that are supporting you and walking along with you, all of you, you will rise up and you will build the walls of righteousness and holiness in your communities in Jesus' name. Look at verse 17. I'm reading chapter 4. I'm sitting in chapter 4, verse 17. They which build it on the wall. And they that bear the burden, and those that laid it, every one with one of their hands wrought in the world, and with the other hand held a weapon. And for the builders, every one had a sword guarded by his side, and so builded. And he that sounded the trumpet was by me. And I said to the nobles, and I said to the rulers, and I said to the rest of the people, the work is great and large. And we are separated upon the wall, one far from another. 
In what place therefore ye hear the sound of the trumpet, resort ye thither unto us, our God shall fight for us. I'm telling you now, if you're going to be a leader in this world in which we live, listen, if in this world in which we live, if you say, I don't like trouble, you will not serve God. If you don't like trouble. Because Satan likes trouble. I said Satan likes trouble. And sinners like trouble. And if you allow the sinners to detect that you run away from trouble, that you run away from difficulty, if you give any slight information to the devil that you fear trouble, aha, uh -huh, he knows how to get you down. But when you come and you say trouble, are you there? If they have not started, I'm looking for you. When you say difficulty, are you there? I'm doing a great work here. And this work, trouble or no trouble, persecution or no persecution, difficulty or no difficulty, rejection or acceptance, this work will be done. Then you'll begin to make the devil tremble. I said you begin to make the devil tremble. <laughs> but you know if you are looking for easy life, it won't take it. It won't get it. You won't be able to get the work done. But it is when you like Nehemiah, you tell the people, we are going to build. But listen, our major assignment is building. Our major work is building. But if it so happens that what we didn't count as part of our work which is fighting. If it comes to it, get ready and fight for your people. And the God of heaven will help you. He said, that's what I said to the nobles. That's what I said to the rulers. That's what I said to the rest of the people. The work is great and large. And then he tells us in verse 21, So we labored in the work. And half of them held the spears from the rising of the morning till the stars appeared. Likewise, at the same time, said I unto the people, Let every one with his servant lodge within Jerusalem. Let's all get together and unite. And the God that followed me, of those men, I told them the same thing, so that there'll be a gird around us in the night, and then they labor in the day. The courage of people that will not give up. You will not give up. I said you will not give up. In Nehemiah chapter 6, from verse 1, now it came to pass, when Shambhalat and Tobiah and Geshem, these people, they never get tired. The enemies will be there, but you'll get more courage. Yeah. In chapter 6, verse 1 now, it came to pass when Shambhalat and Tobiah and Geshem, the Arabian, and the rest of our enemies, they're always there, heard that I had built the wall and that there was no breach left therein, though at that time I had not set up the doors upon the gates that Shambhalat and Geshem sent unto me, saying, Come. Let us meet together in some one of the villages in the plain of Ono. But they thought to do me mischief. They said, okay, Nehemiah, actually we were fighting against the building of the wall some time ago. But you know, we have changed our mind. What we are saying now is, let us, let's, let's go together to a particular place that we are calling you to. Because we have got information. And you need the information we have. There are some men that are trying to hurt you. Let us come together, have a conference together, so we will plan. After, are we going to continue fighting forever? Let us befriend one another. Verse 3. And I sent messengers unto them, saying, I am doing a great work, that I cannot come down. Why should the work cease stop while I leave it and come down unto you? Yet they sent unto me four times after this sort, and I answered them after the same manner. Then sent Shambhalat a servant unto me in like manner, the feast time with an open letter in his hand. Wherein was written, it is reported, among the heathen, and Gashmo says it, 
that thou and the Jews seem to rebel, for which cause thou buildest the wall, that thou mayest be their king. Aha, uh -huh. they change their tactics. You are looking for position. You are building an empire around yourself. We're here. We know what you are trying to do. You want to make yourself a king. And these are the words we're hearing. Come, let us look at everything together. Verse 7. And thou hast also appointed prophets to preach of thee at Jerusalem. Everybody, they are talking about you now. Saying, there is a king in Judah. And now, shall it be reported to the king? According to this was come now therefore. Let us take counsel together. All this thing we are hearing about you. Is it true? Now, if you don't come, so we can have the conference together, iron these points together, then we know that it is true. Is it true? Then I sent to them, saying, There is no such thing done as thou seest, but thou feignest them out of thine own heart. For they all made us afraid, saying, Their hands shall be weakened from the world, that it be not done. Now therefore, O God, God, strengthen my hands. The Lord will strengthen your hands. Afterward, I came to the house of Shemaiah, the son of Deliah, the son of Mehetabiel, uh, who was shut up. And then he said, let us meet together in the house of God within the temple and let us shut the doors of the temple for they will come to slay thee. Yea, in the night they will come and slay thee. Have you heard of these people? They want to tell you, uh, Pastor, I had a dream. What dream did you have? I had a dream that you died and they buried you. And the witches and the wizards, they were celebrating and religious. Shut up! Who died? I'm not dying yet. Are you dying yet? In verse 11, and I said, You're such a man as I flee. Who is there that being such as I am will go into the temple to save his life? I will not go in. Praise the Lord. I pray that God will give you such a courage and you will not run from your post of duty whatever comes to you in Jesus name. Isn't so amazing what God can do with one person, any person, who will not abdicate his responsibility, who will not leave the place of his assignment, but will consecrate the totality of his life, totally, solely, completely, to being all that God wants him to be. Nehemiah knew that God had called him to rebuild the walls and no price was too high to pay. Single-minded, he was courageous. A single-minded believer understands that there is no turning back once God has set the direction of his life. And those of us who are here, ministers of the gospel, preachers of the word of God, the Lord has set the direction of our life already. He has given us the assignment to carry out already. Nehemiah faced much opposition, but he had, he had made up his mind, made up his mind to do God's will. And he moved on without excuse, without hesitation, and without compromise. The weapons of discouragement were used against him. But he set his face steadfastly in the direction that he wanted to go. They will use opposition, a lot of instruments, a lot of weapons of discouragement against you. But you face one direction as a single-minded man, a single-minded woman of conviction. And nothing deters Nehemiah and nothing is going to deter you from the mission that the Lord has called you to. You have seen the weapons of discouragement and opposition they used against him. Number one, ridicule. Number two, wrath and anger, frowning. Number three, scorn, mocking, contempt, ridicule. Number four, conspiracy. Number five, threatening and intimidation. Intimidation. You will die. They will slay you. They will kill you. Number six, destruction. Leave the work. Let's come and have a meeting together. Number seven, fear. Number eight, false prophecy. 
And then number nine, secret intelligence. And there were some people that were spying out on the project, on the program, on the plan, on the things that Nehemiah was doing. And they were reporting to the enemy. And everything he was doing, they were misconstruing it and mistranslating and misrepresenting and sending it to the enemy. They had their secret intelligence. But this man, Nehemiah, he had the quality of decisiveness and the quality of determination. And that made him one of the great leaders in the Bible. That's what will make you the leader you ought to be. And you'll be a good leader. You'll be a great leader. And the strength of the Lord will go with you to the end in Jesus' name. Part 3, the consecration and the cleansing through a single-minded leader. Consecration, cleansing through a single-minded leader. Eventually the walls were all built up. And after the walls were built up, you'll discover something that he didn't even stay alone at the building of the wall. What happened is that he knew that the people needed cleansing. They needed the word of God. And in Nehemiah chapter 8, reading from verse 3, and all the people gathered themselves together as one man into the street that was before the water gate and they spake unto Ezra the scribe to bring the book of the law of Moses and which the law had commanded to Israel and Ezra the priest brought the law before the congregation both of men and women and all that could hear with understanding upon the first day of the seventh month and he read therein before the street that was before the water gate from morning until midday before the men and the women and those that could understand and, and the ears of all the people were attentive Unto the book of the law Eventually revival began In verse 8 So they read in the book of the law of God distinctly And gave the sense And caused them to understand The reading of Nehemiah Which is the Tashatha And Ezra the priest The scribe and the Levites That taught the people Said unto the people This day is holy unto the Lord your God mourn not nor weep for all the people wept when they heard the laws the words of the law they saw their shortcoming the walls had been built and then revival also started they preached the word of God to them they mourned for their sins they repented of their sins and they came back to the God of Israel and then their sorrows turned to joy then said he unto them in verse 10, Go your way, eat the fat, and drink the sweet, and send portions unto them, for whom nothing is prepared. For this day is holy unto the Lord. Neither be ye sorry for the joy of the Lord. For the joy of the Lord. You know, at last the joy came. I said at last the joy came. And to you, my brother, my sister, in your various church locations, the joy has come already. The revival has come already. Consecration and cleansing has come already. And the Lord is sending you back with the courage of Nehemiah, with the conviction of Nehemiah, with the consecration of Nehemiah. What God did through him, God will do through you. You will succeed in the ministry. Don't allow anybody to intimidate you. God has called you for such an hour as this. In your location, you are the man of the time. In your location, you are the woman of the time. And the Lord himself, he will support you. He will be with you. And nobody will bring you down in Jesus' name. And the work the Lord has started through you, you will finish it. You will not die. You will not fall. And nothing will be able to take you out of that work until it is finished in Jesus' name. Are we able? Are we able? I said, are you able? We're able to go and take the country to possess a land from Jordan to the sea.
hallelujah, we are able to go and take the country to possess a land from Jordan to the sea. Amen. Though the child may be on our way to hinder, God will surely give us victory. Victory. Only move on to the righteous side. Move on to the righteous side. Move on to the righteous side with God. Hallelujah, brothers. Move on to the righteous side. Move on to the righteous side. Move on to the righteous side with God. Hallelujah. We are able to go and take the country. Victory, only move on to the righteous side. Move on to the righteous side. Move on to the righteous side with God. Hallelujah, sisters. Move on to the righteous side. Move on to the righteous side. Move on. Let me hear you. Victory, 